Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode seven of Play Watch Listen. We are doing an episode on Portal 2. Um, this series is a series where we go through, uh, I go through, and I play through um, big influential games or games that have something that I think the industry can learn from it. I play through the game on stream, spend a week or so researching the game. After I research it, uh, I research um, the history of the IP, the history of the development of the game, um, what games came out around the release of the game, uh, what I think we can learn from the game, the public reception of the game, all that stuff. And then we have a discussion on stream about us, all, all this information. Uh, we are now on episode 7. We've done certain games like Portal 1. We've done Bioshock, Bioshock 2, Band of Kazooie Nuts and Bolts. We've done Metroid, Prime, the first one. And uh, let's move on to Portal 2, a very, very well-known, very, very well-received game uh, made by Valve. And this was posted, this game was released April 19th of 2011. So Valve, as some of you, um, Valve, as some of you might know, is a game industry studio who uh, is mostly known for having created the Steam uh, launcher. The basically, when people think of PC gaming, people tend to think of Steam. It was originally ubiquitous it was usually it was originally um almost monopolistic that was the only choice either buying disc or downloading it through uh steam itself nowadays we have different launchers we have the origin launcher we have the epic game store we have um the blizzard launcher and everything like that but originally they were uh they they launched steam and they were the only ones they also believe it or not at some point developed video games uh valve is known as the studios who have made the half-life series they made the counter-strike series they made the left for dead series the dota game uh they made the team fortress series portal obviously and probably their most well-known and widely beloved series the artifact series um, so Portal 2 was a sequel to Portal 1, big surprise there. Uh, Portal 1 came out in 2007 to rave reception. Uh, Portal 1 was a game that was originally packaged in the orange box. This was a value box that contained games that were made by Valve. Uh, this included every single release in the Half-Life series up until that point, as well as the newest Team Fortress game. And Portal was included originally just to be as like a fun little bonus. Um, an extra thing that they snuck in, uh, the, the main reason people purchased that game was to play um, the Half-Life series. It was also, uh, the orange box contained the newest expansion for the Half-Life series. Um, it also had, you know, the first, uh, this was the first release for Team Fortress. So those are the main reasons why people bought it. The fact that Portal came packaged along was just a fun little extra benefit and bonus for it. But it turns out that uh, it, it was actually the standout product in the orange box. Most people, it was their favorite uh, game and release that they had in the orange box. So it was supposed to be just a fun little bonus. Ended up being the standout that people were had the most fun with and people started talking about the most. Yep. Yep, we do, in fact, get uh, pictures. I finally got them set up. Um, found out a system, a, a system to make them incorporate it really nicely. So, um, we had Portal 1, which was the origin point before Portal 2. And then we also had uh, something, we, we had a short comic book called Lab Rat. And Lab Rat was basically uh, a, a short little piece that was created to expand the world and the lore of the Portal universe a little bit. But it was mainly there to set up the story um for portal 2 the the happenings between the ending of portal 1 and the beginning of portal 2 to see where uh how we got to this point at the very beginning of it and this was a comic book that also told it from the viewpoint of uh the rat man this was the character who was alluded to very heavily in portal 1 in his hidden little dens his, where he had his mad scrawlings uh drawings all over the wall and it was told from his point of view I actually pictured him a little bit so um, we had the original Portal, then we had the comic book. Um, and when Portal came out, one of the th interesting things about it was one of the aspects of the game drew both as much praise as it received criticism, and that was the length of the game. A lot of people were very happy with the short length of Portal 1 because they felt that Portal 1 was just the perfect length. They didn't have to worry about anything. They didn't have to 
uh, there was no filler. It was everything that was in there deserved to be in there and had some kind of significance or enjoyment out of it. Um, but other people at the same time were very upset with the short length of it because they thought it was so fun. It was a blast and they wanted more. So um, the fact that people were upset about the short length proved that they were craving and just really wanting and desiring a longer experience with a more fleshed out story um, for them to play even more. I like the idea that Portal 1, the company thought it was a bonus, but it was received as a favorite. Well, it's one of those, it was, it was a very small team that worked on Portal 1, and it was also something that was very, very short. Um, the game itself was on average like four to five hours for most people, and I don't really know what the industry was looking like at that time. Um, I do know, you know, we had the, the the Xbox Live Arcade was one of the first major um, sources where people could go and sell cheaper games, not just the full price sixty dollar game or fifty dollar game. I think it was sixty in twenty seventeen um, or twenty two thousand seven. Of course, in twenty seventeen, but. It might have been uh, a market that was much harder to sell the idea of someone dropping $20 on a five-hour release when you have um, tons of AAA games. And we look at it now, and there's been huge success stories uh, since then. You have, like, Plated Studios made Limbo, and they made Inside, both very short games, for about 20 to 30 bucks, and they were rave-reviewed, and people absolutely loved them. So it was definitely a little bit odd, or it was uh, not really fully explored territory on how they wanted to possibly approach that. So it's definitely strange that they kind of just packed it in as a bonus, but um, it was definitely the best way to get it out into consumers' hands and get people to actually try it out and play it for the first time. Um, but I do think it is kind of crazy. They thought it was just like, it could go well, we'll try it out. And it ended up being the, mo the, the, the most highly regarded and generally the most favorite out of all the releases uh, in the entire Orange Box. Anima. It is also really crazy when you think about how Team Fortress 2 had a lot of hype building up to it for a long time during its development. And we also had with um, Half-Life 2 as one of the most beloved IPs in gaming history. One of the most consistent IPs in gaming history. Um, and this was also before it had taken its massive hiatus where it kind of just disappeared off the face of the earth and went into its hibernation. Um, the fact that Portal beat it out in uh, attention and praise is something, it's absolutely wild. Three hours and 15 minutes. Yeah, it's a really short game. It's definitely kind of difficult to, to sell people on shelling out 20 to 30 bucks for a three and a half hour experience um, in video games specifically. When you think about different uh, entertainment mediums, like when it comes to, well, no, books are definitely a lot longer than three hours. They're still the same price, but movies are about, you know, hour and a half to two hours and ticket prices can be between 10 and $20, depending on what you're seeing. But most people don't really think of it much. Um, but for some reason, when it comes to video games, people are much more conscientious of the value they're getting out of their time with uh, basically the formula being how many hours does it take to beat, depending on how much money it costs, as opposed to the enjoyment and the hours. I think that's a uh, something that's starting to change. I think people are starting to realize now that it doesn't necessarily have to be equating to hours played, but enjoyment you get out of it. But at this point in time, it was definitely difficult to uh, to convince people of that. Yeah, I was looking through a couple of the emotes and I uh, decided to add another one. I want to add some more. All right, so that's a little bit of background on the, the Portal IP. We had a full discussion on Portal 1. It's definitely a little bit, sh it's the shortest one that we have compared to a lot of the discussions. Um, but if you want to know a little bit more about the development of Portal 1 itself, you can take a look at the other video we did in the Design by Play series. It was the one released before this one. But um, that's all the real background we could talk about with the portal ip without you know having full discussions on the games again so we're going to talk about portal 2 and how it took shape um portal 2 or sorry portal 1 was released as we said to raving success fans absolutely loved it and critic absolutely loved it as well um usually there's some kind of divide but nope pretty much universal praise across the board from both parties and uh, if you look on many different lists that have been made, uh, it tends to be uh, Portal is usually on the list of one of the greatest video games of all times. 
for tons of different reasons. Again, part of it because of how short and concise it is. Um, but the team who worked on Portal 1 was a very small team. It was a team that never actually uh, reached more than 10 people working on it at a time. Um, and they had different members of Valve who would come in and play test it. And they would, you know, those people who would play test it, they would fall in love with the game. But once the game was fully out and released to the public, you had some 150 odd employees at Valve who then fell in love with the game themselves and were clamoring to work on it, uh, the IP too. So, um, kind of just the, the, the floodgates opened. You had 150 people, very experienced individuals with uh, a fantastic track record who finally had the drive and the desire to work on a game uh, all fighting to try to get in that position. And I don't know if this is how it was in 2007. I feel like this came, or uh, yeah, in 2007. I think this kind of came up in an interview and then I think about it. I should have researched this, but I never thought about this. Um, in modern day times, in current times, the way that Valve works now is they don't actually force anyone to work on a specific project um their philosophy is if people have a strong desire to work on a game then they will go and work on it and when that happens the product ends up becoming much more uh just a much better product overall they don't really like to force people to start working on a product because they think they end up getting really crappy results uh it's probably part of the reason why we haven't had many releases uh games made by valve as of recently but they don't force people to work on games um, they just, when people have a desire to work on the game, then they go and they, they work on it. It's also why there's uh, a lot of different people who float from project to project inside the studio. So, um, synergy is a very strong thing there, yeah. Um, people just having the desire and the drive to work on a project. And then they had 150 people who were trying to, who were fighting to get on it and work on Portal 2. It's a lot of people. So, sequel on Portal, on the first Portal game started almost immediately after launch. And the early stages of Portal 2 were very, very different from the final result that we got in Portal 2. And they were, I mean, very, very different from what we had in Portal 1. So, first and foremost, Portal 2 uh, didn't have portals. I know that seems very odd. You would think that, you know, the, the, the game called Portal, the video game called Portal 2 would have portals, but no, that wasn't the case at the beginning. So the original idea behind Portal was that they didn't want to have... Uh, actually, let me back up for a second. Instead of using portals, um, they were going to be doing something called the F-Stop was the name of the mechanic. And the way this mechanic worked, we finally only understood how it worked very recently. And that was because um, we had known for a while that it was called F-Stop and this was a new mechanic that they were planning on using for Portal 2. But Valve never really divulged much information at all because they said that they were holding on to the idea to use it for a further uh, a project further down the line. But as of recently, um, Valve gave the original source code for this mechanic and gave it to a brand new developer entirely. And they were working on a new game called Exposure. And this new developer uploaded a video showcasing the mechanic and how it worked uh, as of recently. So basically what would happen is the player would take a camera and then they would snap a picture of some kind of object in the world somewhere. So they would take a picture of maybe a box. They would take a picture uh, of, of the box and then they would be able to take that picture and replace that image somewhere else in the world around them. So you could, uh, and, and uh, on top of placing it in the world around you, you could also change the scaling of the object. So you could take pictures of boxes and replace them in the world at varying sizes so you could essentially create a staircase to reach new areas you couldn't reach before. Um, you could take a picture of a fan and then a uh, the ceiling fan and then place it on the ground and increase the size of it so that you would create an updraft that you could ride up to a ledge up above and go to a next area. The idea originally was that they didn't want the Portal IP to be associated with Portal specifically. Um, they wanted the Portal IP to be something that is, each game was located inside Aperture with a new puzzle mechanic that was introduced each time to, to solve puzzles. Um, they were they, they said they were going to cross the bridge of why it was named Portal <laughs> at some other point, but this is the idea that they want to run with and keep going. So they had been working on this. This mechanic uh, existed, the F-stop mechanic existed for the first five months of development of Portal 2. 
and they were going through playtesting phases and playtesters loved it. They thought it was great. They thought it was fun. But the problem was players were very vocal that they wanted to get their hands on the portal gun again. <laughs> no matter what, people found it fun, but they, they knew it was supposed to be a game that was a sequel to Portal, and all they were wanted to know was when were they going to actually get to the part with the portal gun. So, um, another change that they had, uh, aside from having no portals in Portal 2, there was going to be no Chell. Chell wasn't going to be a character in the game. Um, when Portal 2 was announced... The Valve had sent out a patch to update and change um, Portal on every single platform. And in the original ending for Portal 1, after uh, you know defeating Boss and Aperture explodes, Chell passes out in the parking lot. And it's heavily insinuated that Chell then escaped after having defeated GLaDOS. Um, but that was the original ending. After the patch came out, it was changed. So right before Chell finally does pass out in the parking lot, you see her slowly being dragged back into the facility. When deciding if they were going to have Chell come back as a player again for Portal 2, um, they, the, the original answer and decision was no, that she had escaped. Um, it was clearly insinuated she escaped. GLaDOS was dead. It was told that GLaDOS had killed everyone inside the facility with the neurotoxin gas. Um, what else would there be? So it was insinuated that she had escaped. Um, why bring her back for the next game? So instead, they created a new character, a new uh, main character whose name was Mel. And early playtesters were totally fine with this. They had no issues. Uh, they were fine with a brand new character until they ran into GLaDOS, where when the player encountered GLaDOS, um, GLaDOS obviously did not recognize Mel, and that was the big issue. To have a sequel where, um, more or less, it ignores the things that the player, uh, inter the interaction between GLaDOS and the player, that it was ignored and basically forgotten, really hampered uh, players' first impressions and their experiences with the game. So when they realized that this was just such a, a, a big smack in the face early on in the game that kind of set the tone um, for the rest of the game, the devs decided to um, bring back Chell for the next one. So... <clears throat> at an early point in development as well there was no glados either uh the devs didn't want to have another game where glados was the villain they wanted to do something different <clears throat> they also felt that she had gone through a full arc in portal one and that if they were going to do if they were going to bring back glados into portal 2 they would want her to go through a different type of arc but they didn't know how they could do that uh since she would be you know essentially a villain type of role um, <clears throat> in the end, they decided they wanted a brand new villain, and specifically, they wanted to have a villain where it was a character that started off as a good person, but eventually made the transition into becoming a villain because they thought the process of someone good becoming evil was really interesting to, uh, to see and witness. So, GLaDOS wasn't going to be a character in the game. Normally, uh, she was going to be a small cameo character. Uh, she was going to be a small robot, <clears throat> a new robot, that would uh, appear in every chamber <clears throat> right before you started the chamber, and it was going to have the same name as GLaDOS. Uh, you know, GLaDOS's name is a, uh, what's it called, uh, acronym for gyroscopic, li um, sorry, that's wrong, genetic life form and disk operating system, but in this new version, she was going to be called the gyroscopic liability absolver and disk operating system, so that was going to be her existence, she was going to be a small cameo, where she'd be a little robot that at the beginning of each uh, test chamber would rattle off a bunch of legal stuff, basically absolving aperture of any kind of legal issues or liability in the situation, uh, very similar to how at the end of medicine commercials, how they, they list off all the symptoms of how you're going to be bleeding from your ears and pass out and go blind and all that stuff but uh that was going to be as the that was going to be any kind of implementation of glados originally uh the villain was supposed to be cave johnson actually and uh, portal 2 was supposed to take place in the 50s where cave johnson was trying to put himself into a computer his personality to the computer uh and then realizing that it was a huge mistake to do so but um, <clears throat> just like people were very vocal about not wanting, uh, about missing the portal gun, and have pe uh, people were very vocal about having Miss Glados as well. 
and the devs expected this to an extent the devs did expect players to be sad and to miss glados but the devs had definitely a bit of a skewed vision in how they viewed glados compared to everyone else so um the devs for years while working on this game were dealing with and seeing glados every day uh for years whereas most players only got to experience glados for you know three to five hours and even then they only got to see her for a couple minutes and on top of it the few minutes that they do get to see and interact with glados is when she actually starts showing some type of human emotions that right there that is how most people remember glados they don't remember as the disembodied narrator voice who's playing over the the speakers and all the test chambers they think of her as the 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 robot the monster that they face that shows actual relatable um emotions <clears throat> as opposed to um what the play what the devs felt like having seen her every single day harnessing and developing her character and trying to build up her arc and her personality um their experiences were, were very very different and um once they they really compared these two together it made complete sense as to why the players wanted uh glados back as a major character mm -hmm. cave johnson the good boy yeah exactly well so most uh, as you can see most of the staples the staple core mechanics that were part of portal or not even just the core mechanics, just the core associations as well, um, that they were trying to change, got some kind of negative feedback in that people wanted, you know, they wanted those old things back. And Gabe Newell actually uh, caught one of this and suggested to the team that they should try going in a different direction. And so uh, the team added the portal gun back, they, ordered, they added back Chow, and they brought back GLaDOS. <laughs> so they eventually relented. Oops, whoa. Oh, I was on the wrong scene. Whoops, I changed music. My bad. That's what I meant to do. I meant to change the title. So, um, that's a little bit of interesting info about the uh, early development and how Portal 2 was going to be something completely, wildly, vastly different than what we got with the Portal 2 uh, that we had on release. Um, wasn't going to have the basic title in it. Wasn't going to have portals. Wasn't going to have the main character. Wasn't going to have the villain. Um... All things synonymous and known with Portal. I mean, Portal's known for the portals. GLaDOS is one of the most well-known and well-written and beloved villains in video gaming. Um, it's wild to think that they uh, spent months and months trying to create something so vastly different than what we got. So... Uh, we talked about the brief history of the Portal IP. We've talked about um, some of the earlier attempted design decisions and changes that they made to Portal. So before we actually jump into and talk about the final result, the, the, the final product that we got out of Portal, let's talk about some of the games that came out around the release of Portal 2's uh, schedule. Uh, I like to talk about this for a couple different reasons. I like to talk about this because I feel like a lot of people uh, think that there's so many dead years in gaming that there's so many better years in gaming that uh, they don't realize that almost every single year in gaming has had some kind of huge releases. <clears throat> there's definitely some better than others. 2007 is a fantastic year. But um, I think it, it, it also puts into perspective just how many great games are released each year. It's also, I think, important to consider that the average consumer, the average person who buys and pays for video games only has a you know a budget a set amount they could spend you know i feel like it's safe to say a lot of people will limit on average uh like a hundred dollars a year on games you know two major releases roughly and while it's uh definitely important to compare the the releases we talk about to competitors of the same genre i think it's also important to consider just major releases as well because there are lots of people who play uh, a wide variety of different types of games um i'm someone who loves to play nintendo games i like to play puzzle games i like to play shooters i like to play tons of different games so um if i have a budget of 100 dollars, is not necessarily going to be 100 dollars on shooters 100 dollars on platformers 100 on puzzles it could be 100 dollars entirely so um looking at the release of this game compared to some of the other major releases i think also puts it into perspective um what they were the, they were going up against because it's not just direct competition with your genre it's also competition with the industry at large with how many great games there are out there because um 
a lot of people don't stick to just one type of game. So, uh, Portal 2 was released April 19th of 2011, and what I like to do is I look at like to look at the six months before and the six months after the release of the game. So we're not just going to be looking at all of 2011, we'll be looking at some of 2010's releases. So, um, leading up to the release, this is the six months before April 2011, um, we had... Uh, for games that I would say are not direct competitors, we had the first Black Ops that came out. We had the first, we had Assassin's Creed Brotherhood came out. We had Sonic Colors came out and Donkey Kong Country Returns come out. Um, not a whole lot in the grand scheme of things, especially when you consider the fact that the six months before April was November and December. And November and December is when uh, releases really start to come out. It's the holiday season. Publishers really like to get their games out before that window to try to scoop up as many cells as possible. So when you look at it, as far as major releases, um, big known titles, really was pretty pretty slow year, 2010, apparently, um, with, with only four really standout titles. But um, we did have one title that would be, I would say, a competitor to the Portal series. And that was, uh, in the six months leading up to Portal, we actually had 999 was released in the US. This is a fantastic, um, visual novel, puzzle game, escape room simulator, mishmash. It's uh, nine hours, nine people, nine doors. I highly recommend playing it if you have not played it already. Um, great puzzle game. Um, but it it's still, even in the grand scheme of things, like that was the only real competitor that we had for... Um, for Portal 2 and puzzle games, and while 999 has garnered a very strong cult following, uh, it did not sell all that fantastically. And uh, so Portal 2 really did not have much in the terms of uh, competition, especially when you consider the fact that six months following the release of Portal 2, I couldn't find any games that really were uh, at all puzzle games either. So Portal had a pretty clear open window. Need eight other people? Single player game. You don't need people to play with it, Cairo. It's a really, really good game. It's also on PlayStation 4, I believe. It was originally released on DS, and DS is definitely the better system to play it on um, for reasons I can't explain because it would be spoilers, but I will say that uh, 999 does a fantastic job of utilizing the DS hardware structure format to make it uh, a really enjoyable experience. It just takes advantage of it so well to create an awesome story. Um, it's on PlayStation. It's still fine on PlayStation. Um, again, it's something that takes the, the, the great mechanic about 999 that's on the DS. Um, it doesn't exist on PlayStation, but it also doesn't ruin it because you're not aware of it. I, I, I won't say anything other than that. I will say play 999 if you liked Portal. It's a fantastic puzzle game. Um, and if you can play it on DS, great. If you can't, that's fine too. But yes, it is a single player game. It just has nine characters in it. But anyway, um, for the six months after Portal came out, um, there were some more games. Uh, th there were definitely more than the six months beforehand. Still no puzzle, but um, for other games, we had Terraria was released. We had Infamous 2, the highly anticipated game that just met all the expectations. We had Duke Nukem Forever came out. We had Fear 3 was released, Bastion, um, the first release by Supergiant Games. If you have been playing the game Hades recently, uh, that was made by Supergiant Games. Uh, Bastion was the first release by that studio. So that was released after uh, six months after Portal. Um, we had Dead Island, the industry standard of fantastic, phenomenal trailers that are also very misleading from the actual gameplay you get. Um, Gears of War 3 came out. We had the original Binding of Isaac was released. And Batman Arkham City came out. God, Arkham City was so good. So all in all, I think compared to other years, 2011 was a bit of a slower year. I mean, there definitely was some fantastic games. Portal 2, obviously, Donkey Kong Country Returns, um, Arkham City, Duke Nukem Forever, but uh, one thing I'm noticing is I, this was a real quiet year from Nintendo. I mean, you had Donkey Kong Country, uh, Donkey Kong Country Returns, and I, I guess kind of Sonic Colors, but like no, no, nothing from Nintendo's major uh, IPs. Definitely a quiet year from Nintendo in 2011. I wonder what that could be. Um, in terms of Major IPs, I mean, you had Gears of War and you had uh, Infamous, but 
it was it was actually a relatively slow year in 2011. Portal 2 did not have to worry too much in terms of competition. Uh, I mean, Black Ops is a huge competition game, but all in all, a relatively slow year. Black and White, did Pokemon Black and White, was that released in Japan or the US? Because I'm considering Japan, uh, US releases only. For example, when I talked about 999, um, it had released in Japan months prior. Uh, this was the US release date. So Black and White, might have I might have missed that, it is possible. But March and April of 2011, was that US or was that Japan? Huh, I guess I clearly missed that, my bad. Whoopsie, definitely overlooked it. Oh. Well, there you go. <laughs> then we'll add another one to that list. <clears throat> so, those are the games that came out around Portal 2's release. Um, now let's talk about the actual game itself. Let's talk about Portal, and we'll start off with the characters. So the first character we had was Chell. Chell was the silent protagonist of Portal 2, and she is silent and protagonistic as ever. She's basically just meant to be brought back to further explore the relationship between Chell and GLaDOS, or more specifically, GLaDOS and the player. Uh, she is a silent protagonist. She doesn't say anything. Um, she's just meant to be a vessel to be the same vessel that existed in the first Portal to continue the story between GLaDOS and Chell. Really not much to say about her. Um, then after Chell, we can talk a little bit about GLaDOS. So GLaDOS was brought back um, to show, uh, again, to explore the, the relationship between the player character as well as GLaDOS. But um, part of the reason why they also brought her back was that at the end of Portal 1, we talked about it briefly, is that she started showing he was some human emotions. Um, for most of Portal 1, GLaDOS is very indifferent. She was very unbiased. She was mean. But she was mainly just a character pushing the player forward onto the next uh, test, even if it was to antagonize, even through means of antagonization at the time. Um, but during th that, that was the, the majority of the gameplay you had in Portal 1 and your interactions with GLaDOS. But during the final fight, the, the encounter with GLaDOS in Portal 1, um, during the process, you destroy her morality core. And it just creates this instant change in GLaDOS where she starts showing uh, much more malicious and emotionally draw, uh, driven dialogue. And Portal 2 was the opportunity for them to explore this new personality that GLaDOS had developed at the end of Portal. Because again, she was, she was a very uh, typical, stereotypical, normal, unbiased, uh, flat robot. I mean, she had great writing, but in terms of personality, she was very bland. Um, she finally started showing some kind of human relatable emotions at the end of Portal 1, and very shortly after, we get to kill her, and Portal 2 was fantastic because it gave them the opportunity to actually showcase this and how she would then use these emotions uh, against the player or as motivations. Specifically, the more malicious emotions that she was showing towards Chell because, again, Portal 2 starts, uh, she immediately recognizes Chell as the person who tried to kill her, so not only does she have uh, showing malicious motions at the end, and now she had reason to show malicious motions as opposed to just be evil. <clears throat> oh, so this is Japanese date. Oh, no. Okay, so it, it, the March 2011 was US date. Okay, I missed that. So, after GLaDOS, we have Wheatley. Wheatley, uh, well, in Portal 1, the story kind of sneaks up on the player. Uh, because the player doesn't really even know that story exists in the game until about two-thirds into it. A lot of people going into it, they thought it was just, you know, a fun puzzle game. Just a interesting mechanic, unique mechanic about using portals to solve puzzles. And then all of a sudden, boom, there's actual story, there's narrative, there's reason for why all this is happening. And Wheatley's job in Portal 2 was to uh, introduce the story and give the player goals right off the bat. He gives the whole background of the story. Um, he kind of catches the player up on what happened in Portal 1. And he's also guiding them from point to point where they need to go next to continue through and continue the story. He's also there to very clearly establish the game as a comedy and it is okay to laugh. <laughs> 
Um, the first game has very dark and very dry sense of humor that a lot of people almost kind of felt uncomfortable because they weren't sure if they were supposed to be laughing or not. Um, it's just kind of one of the, the things that happen when you have a villain who is a robot without personality, without uh, <clears throat> any kind of emotion in it. You don't know if the writing that that, that she, uh, she it, with a very dry type of dialogue that she gives, you can't tell if what she's saying is meant to be dry humor that you're laughing at, or maybe you're just sick in the head. Um, Wheatley there <clears throat> makes it very clear and obvious that this is meant to be a comedy game. It is meant to be something uh, to laugh at. <clears throat> so, uh, not only does he help acclimate the characters on the story and introduce the story um, and create the setting for it, he was also a character that was used to catch up new players in uh, tutorializing the mechanics to new individuals. Um, you know, he leads them from location to location, telling them what to do, where to go. He leads them to the portal gun. He tells them where to aim the portal gun and everything like that. Um, oops. Um, he, he was also used as a tool that was disposed of by GLaDOS to uh, show new players just, just truly how monstrous GLaDOS is. Um, players in the first game know how evil GLaDOS was. Uh, for new players, it's just this large hulking computer piece that comes back to life. They don't really, they, they understand the size and the scope of GLaDOS, but they don't understand uh, who she is or what her personality or the th type of threat that she poses. Her being able to dispose of Wheatley, the only good person that you encounter, the only person you encounter in the game, um, crushing him right before your very eyes without a second thought or a, a care while doing it, really set to build just how evil uh, of a person that she is, what what a true threat that GLaDOS is as a character. And then finally, the last important role that Wheatley had was he eventually assumes the role of the villain. As we talked earlier, the developers wanted... They, they wanted to bring back GLaDOS, but they were also worried because she would clearly become the villain role and they wanted to do something different. They said that they wanted to explore a role of someone who was good, who then becomes evil, and Wheatley is that, uh, he fills that role. He, um, well, he was originally meant to be just a short introductory character who is, uh, you know, supposed to show the pit the player of the world to tutorialize, a tutorialize them a little and show how evil GLaDOS was, they realized that he also uh, fit perfectly, fit the bill to become that nice character who eventually turns evil and eventually becomes the villain as well. So he was later repurposed into that. Cast to Steven Merchant as Wheatley was a brilliant move. He did such a fantastic job. Um, in the early, early demo builds that they were showing at E3 and the likes, they hadn't fully uh, booked Steven as the voice for Wheatley. So they just had one of the uh, the people who worked at Valve just record basic lines for him. <clears throat> and when uh, people played it, they thought he was hilarious. They thought he was great. That when the news broke that Steven was actually um, cast as the voice for Wheatley and that he would be replacing the voice for Wheatley, people were very, very upset and very, very vocal, saying they were going to boycott the game because they wanted uh, the voice to stay as the original character that it was. Just goes to show that uh, no matter what, there will always be people who are going to be upset at some point um, with any kind of changes whatsoever because it was clearly the best decision they could have ever made. Um, was having Steven voice Wheatley. And you can go look on YouTube and you can find gameplay of the uh, the, the original voice that was uh, the placeholder during the uh, E3 demos and the, and the location, the, the different conventions. And I mean, the, the voice for the guy who did it in the demo was fine, but Steven just absolutely embodied him perfectly. They did such a good job. So... <clears throat> the last character that we're going to talk about is Cave Johnson. Uh, we'll very briefly touch on him. He was originally a southern billionaire in the earlier designs of the game, but he ended up uh, finalizing as a millionaire from the Midwest who made his millions making shower curtains for the army through contracts. He truly was living the American dream. Uh, he, he was basically just, uh, he was supposed to be the villain, as we said early. Uh, he was supposed to be the villain for Portal 2. Uh, this ended up not being the case when they decided to go back to GLaDOS and eventually Wheatley as the villain, but they decided to keep him and incorporate him as he is the voice and the kind of guiding figure through the test chambers uh, when you get into deep and old aperture. 
Um, they kept uh, they kept it true to his original time period. He was uh, Portal Two was originally supposed to take place in the fifties, so he still uh, he was alive in the fifties, and these are just recordings of him as an after result. Um, again, fantastic character, so well written, and uh, I'm drawing a blank on his name, but JJ Joan did a great job voicing him because that's how I know him as. <laughs> but he did good. Um, so those are pretty much all the characters that you will jk simmons thank you that is pretty much all the uh, characters you encounter in the portal 2 world so now we're going to move on to the world and the story that uh existed in portal 2 and like we said originally portal 1 had a very small team they were much more limited in scope and resources and money and manpower to get the final result that they wanted to um, Portal 2, they did not have that same issue. They had, as we said, over 150 people clamoring and dying to try to work on this game. So they were able to create much more fully realized worlds in Portal 2. Uh, in Portal 1, because of their limitations, they were forced to use, uh, d because of, of um, limitations on manpower and time, they had to use Half-Life assets. So... In the later part of the game, the last quarter of the game, it takes place, you know, behind the curtain, behind closed doors as you go into the actual facility outside of the chambers. It's got these dark, brown, murky, rusted type of uh, hallways and corridors and locations. And while I myself have not played the Half-Life series yet, I will be playing them in the near future. Um, from what I from, from what I asked chat when I was playing, they said this is pretty much what Half-Life looks like. The, the, the game looks pretty much copy and pasted. Uh, textures like this um, because the team they they used what was on hand they did the best that they could not to discredit them or put them down or anything like that you know when when it comes to getting a product and uh, trying to get it out the door uh, a finished product you do what you can um, but now in portal 2 they had an art team they had a fully dedicated art team they were able to create more uh, a more original look and feel to the world they weren't uh, restricted to using pre-existing assets that a lot of people would look at and go oh that's from this game this isn't from portal this is from half-life this is something entirely different it really goes a long way to make sure that the world you are creating is something that is unique to that world entirely or else it can really take people out of it but they were able to create more original uh, look and feel to the world. And in the original Portal 1, they had from early on the designs and the idea was that all the rooms would be modularly assembled and then reassembled. But they just didn't have the resources to get that done and they were really excited to show that off in Portal 2. So in the earlier stages of the game, you will see as things are being repaired and put back together in the test chamber, you see these manical, uh, manical, mechanical mechanized arms that are uh some of them are just falling out of place but also you see them as they're kind of shifting and and moving things out of the way and and fixing the walls to be much more clean and pristine and the floors to be more even there's a section where you'll be walking through a hallway and there's just a ton of garbage and debris that's in the way so the walls just kind of reach out grab the debris and just pull it aside and clear the pathway for you and they were really excited to show this in Portal 2, but what was really great about this is this really drove the point home that GLaDOS really was in control of everything, that she wasn't just the all-knowing, seeing presence, the one that's always watching over you, but she actually manipulates and controls the entire environment around you at all times. Uh, really, really terrifying way to show that she is completely in control. So, <clears throat> oh, thank you, Rob. I love game design. It's just so fucking fascinating to me. I love research on this stuff. So, uh, in the early stages of the game, uh, it, it, in the beginning of the game, uh, uh, as a very brief catch up, you know, you wake up, uh, your character's been asleep for an undisclosed amount of time. And <clears throat> when you start leaving and escaping, you see that the facility that you were sleeping in had become, uh, it had basically fallen to ruin. And that uh, stages had become dilapidated and they were in shambles and mother nature had started to take over with vines uh, encrusting over moss growing in different places. Um, there's even locations where there's like puddles of water that uh, started to uh, appear of stagnant water. And then they could, 
in the process of going through, you see that this this encroaching Mother Nature uh, feeling starts to disappear and starts going back to the normal, clean, pristine type of uh, test chambers that we know as of later. But uh, it was the, the original destroyed kind of facility as it transitions into the close and pristine but then you also had i mean we showed the images before of what the back area looked like and it just looked like something copy and paste out of half-life but now because they had dedicated our team they were able to create these large open cavernous sections of the building that really just showed how massive and grand this facility was um you you had the the rooms in the, the back rooms in the end of portal one that still looked they were uh big they were very tall but they looked more uh realistic they look like something that you could experience or look at yourself whereas you look at them in this game and it looks larger than life it almost looks like something that truly is impossible and it, it, it almost it feels like how could this be so large but it still fit into the world it was uh really really impressive how they managed to balance it perfectly you i uh, like the opening line you have been asleep for a nine 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 static yeah they uh they don't exactly reference how long she had been asleep for um they do uh, kind of explain why she was able to sleep for that long in the ratman comic briefly I mean, for all we know, those 99999 could have been seconds. Still a long time, but... <coughs> but, um, yeah, they, they no longer had to rely on the Half-Life assets anymore. Um, they also had, on top of the, the in-between sections, uh in-between chambers where you go into the back areas of Aperture as you move from place to place, but... You also have a time period where you are in the deep parts of Aperture, the old parts of Aperture, the part where we hear Cave Johnson. This is um, long closed off, long sectioned off and abandoned sections of Aperture that are very deep inside the facility. Um, and it, it basically, in, in the original Portal, the, the aesthetic of the test chambers was definitely unique and was Portal in itself, but the in-betweens and the extra stuff afterwards didn't really have its own unique appeal to it. Whereas in Portal 2, um, they still use the obviously typical kinds of uh, aesthetics and art style for the Portal rooms because that was its own style. But the in-betweens of the chambers and the tests definitely felt more varied. They felt more unique and they felt like a more living, breathing world. So having the art team really paid off in that case. It was really, really beautiful. Um, so... They, the, the devs wanted to, when, when, when building upon and expanding into Portal 2, they wanted to keep to the rules that were set by the first Portal game, but they realized also, they learned they didn't have to be a slave to it necessarily. Uh, one of the examples of this was the elevator room. So in Portal 1, after you completed a chamber, it was the same every single time. It was very basic. It was very simple. It was, there was an Emancipation Grill, which was just a little bubbly kind of texture in front of you that if you tried to bring anything from the previous test chamber into the elevator, it would just delete it. It would, you know, vaporize it. And then in front of the Emancipation Grill was the elevator. There was no walking around it. There was no exploring around it or getting over it, getting above it. It was a very, very narrow hallway that had the Emancipation Grill directly into the elevator. So in Portal 2, this was changed a little bit. They became these very large rooms that had, you know, a uh, large staircase going down to it. They had glass ceilings. It had glass floors. The elevator itself was glass. It looked much more modern. It looked much more futuristic. And then in the room surrounding the elevator for, you know, 348 degrees in the room with the only 20 degrees being left over for the actual uh, walkway and the uh, staircase in and out of the room, um, 340 degrees of giant screen monitor televisions that had different videos playing on it uh, at times to show different either puzzle mechanics or to showcase uh, the world around it and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Um, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> there's, there's, there's no reason why this should have been done. Um, when you look at Portal 1 into Portal 2, you have an undisclosed uh, amount of time has passed. 
time that there is absolutely no one alive or unalive if you're functioning as a computer um trying to maintain this facility enough time has passed that mother nature has overgrown into the facility and destroyed it um there's no single logical reasonable explanation why we go from a very simple bland plain jane boring elevator room to a very large grandiose elevator room with monitors and televisions and everything there's no logical explanation why that happens but no no one said a thing no players brought it up no one questioned it no one asked about it no one was upset no one even acknowledged it <laughs> So they left it in because why wouldn't they? It's uh, it's it's an it's a better user experience. I remember looking at the things that they would play on the TVs, and I thought they were funny. I thought they were great, um, and it, it improved the experience overall. Even though it made absolutely no sense that they would have this change in the first place. And the devs learned that as long as you're improving things, especially minor things, minor inconsequential things, uh, n no one's gonna mind. No one's gonna talk about it or bring it up. And I actually looked for this too. I went and looked in different reviews for uh, for Portal 2 at different sites. I never saw anyone even mentioning this uh, at all. <laughs> so while it is good to follow the rules established from previous games, uh, if it is a improvement to the experience overall, um, no one's gonna say a thing. No one's gonna be upset. Um, so the chambers themselves uh, were pretty much the same thing from Portal 1 into Portal 2. Modern HD textures, um, obviously new puzzles, but the aesthetic and the art style of them were pretty much the same. Um, at the beginning, as we said, they were overgrown, but as time goes on, that starts to dial back as GLaDOS gains control of the facility and it starts cleaning it up um, until they become prim and pristine and clean like they are in uh, Portal 1. But the mechanics in Portal 1, were, or sorry, that were in Portal 2, had a lot of differences between Portal 1. So let's first talk about uh, updated mechanics. So the first thing that we have is that the energy balls are no more. Uh, the energy balls, whew, there's there's a lot of problems with these things. This this These existed in Portal 1. They were a mechanic that the player basically had to manipulate this floating ball into a designated receptacle somewhere else in the level. They could do this by uh, shooting a portal to um, end up having the ball locate to a different location. They could use a uh, companion cube to redirect it however they so choose. But uh, that was the main goal of it was to get this energy ball from wherever it spawned at to wherever the receptacle place was located. Some of the problems, uh, one of them was that uh, when this energy ball would spawn after a certain amount of time, it would eventually despawn and disappear. And then after a certain time after that, the uh, origin point, it would spawn out again. So the players, if they failed to get it to the receptacle and it disappeared, they would then have to track all the way back to the original origin spawn point and repeat the process of trying to get the uh, energy ball to where it needs to end up being, which was a drag. Um, the other thing is the player had to wait for the ball to travel and it was kind of slow and drag things on because it had to be slow enough where the players could react to it and try to uh, time whatever it is that they were trying to do to manipulate to the certain location that they wanted to. And then on top of that, if the ball ever touched the player, they instantly died. Um, it was a instant death mechanic. If the ball touched the player, they would fall flat on the ground. Instantly had to start the puzzle over. Um, and sometimes the ball would surprise the players and hit them from behind. And they would be frustrated and confused as to why the hell they just died trying to figure it out. But it didn't matter. They'd have to start over the puzzle anyway. And uh, especially when it comes to puzzle games uh you don't really want your player getting frustrated and dying and not being sure as to why that even happened in the first place so uh in the end they took the puzzles or sorry they took the energy balls and they instead replaced them with energy beams it was the same thing as death orb from half-life 2 i actually have not played half-life 1 or half-life 2 yet so i don't know yet um i will be playing the half-life series in the near future um, if I remember correctly, I, the next game we're doing is Spec Ops The Line, and I think after that we're doing Half-Life 1. But I am excited to play the Half-Life series for so many different reasons. Oh, I've heard they're fantastic as well. I'll definitely keep an eye out for that, actually. I wouldn't be surprised if it was... Wait, no. I wouldn't be surprised if it was from Half-Life 2, because they reused assets from the Half-Life series. So if they did that for 
um, portal with the uh, energy ball spawners. That would make total sense. So the energy balls were instead replaced with energy beams. And they also included a cube to redirect, redirect the beams. <coughs> this was a wonderful addition because feedback and influences that the players uh, exhibited on the beams was instant. You could immediately tell what the end result was when you uh, interacted with the beam or tried to manipulate it in some way. You didn't have to wait for the ball to travel uh, or anything like that. Instant feedback is always nice. Uh, the beam itself was no longer an instant kill, unlike the ball was. Um, the player would, if they ran into the beam, there'd be a very large, uh, a very loud audio cue. There'd be a very clear visual cue with red uh, glowing effect all around the outside of the screen. Um, Chell would moan in pain, I'm assuming. And uh, it, it, you have to run into the beam, I believe, three or four times in a short window to kill yourself. So not no longer so strictly punishing and you also did not have to do the long treks back to the origin points unlike you had to do with the energy ball uh so energy beam was wonderful addition so much better than the energy balls uh they also something else that they tweaked was they were no longer timer based puzzles and instead they did switch based ones so this one's a little bit hard to explain i couldn't really find any good clear images that kind of showed this off but um, in Portal 1, the first thing that you, uh, one of the first things that you do is to introduce the portal mechanic. Uh, you are given, you're put in a room where one of the port, one of the two portals is stationary the entire time. And then on a timer of about like five seconds, I believe, uh, the other portal will cycle around the room to one of the four different walls. And then you're supposed to be, you know, doing what you need to do by going through the timer, uh, going through the portals in the correct timer and in the correct order. Um, a lot of people were very confused about this. It seems very simple. It seems very obvious in hindsight. But one, not everyone grasps video games uh, very quickly. Not everyone plays a ton of video games. But also you have to remember that portal was still a pretty unique concept at the time. So it wasn't as easy as intu and, and uh, intuitive for some people. So uh, some people wouldn't know necessarily what the sound effect was because before the portal would rotate to another point of the room, uh, there'd be a little sound effect. They didn't quite know what that meant. Um, they didn't realize why sometimes the portal would take them to a different location than before. And sometimes they would go into a portal and then be trapped in there for 15 seconds. It would be completely unaware why. So uh, it was... When you look back on it in hindsight, not the best tutorial, and they really fix this a lot in Portal 2, where they have um, – in it's, it's the same type of principle where there is one portal that is stationary in the room, and there is four portals that go around the room in other – or I believe it's three portals on three different types of the walls, three sides of the walls, but they're no longer timer-based. They're button prompts where when you go up and you press the button, the portal appears right before you at the wall that you're facing, and it makes it a lot easier uh, to understand and grasp exactly how the portals work, and uh, it, it helps to tutorialize the, the player better, and they're no longer stuck on a timer-based system. It's something entirely in control of the player. Um, the other huge benefit to doing this type of system, button-based uh, puzzles instead of timer-based puzzles, is when you're doing a button-based puzzle, you can position the button placement to be in a certain way that when the player goes to press the button, their camera's probably going to be oriented in the direction that they uh, the effect is happening. So there's no longer a case of... Um, a time after a certain timer going off an effect happens behind you and the player doesn't know what happens um you press the button and because you're facing the button you can clearly see where the effect is taking place that takes out the confusion um in the first place so tons of uh really minor changes that are uh something a lot of people wouldn't think of but really really enhance the experience overall either through from a tutorial perspective or just from a uh, good player uh quality of life player experience type of perspective Oh, it was great, Brian. Spec Ops, Doom. Okay, so we'll do Spec Ops the line, then we're going to do Doom 1, and then we'll do Half-Life. Okay. Two real OG ones back to back, right? Um, another thing that they enhanced and made better in Portal 2 was they actually had jumps. Jumps were actually jumps, which was great. Um, in the grand scheme of things... Having, uh, in Portal 2, the jumps were much bigger than they were in, in Portal 1. And this is purely cosmetic. Um, it, it, it's really all relative. 
if I play a game where, you know, I can jump 10 times higher than I can in Portal 2, it really means absolutely nothing if every single ledge I try to jump up onto is 10 times higher than any in Portal 2, and the gaps are 10 times wider than any gap in Portal 2. It's really entirely relative to what the distance and the gap is between um, jumps <laughs> relative to what the height is. Um, but I think the huge benefit to this is if you go back and play Portal 1, you'll see just how minuscule and how pathetic uh, of a jump Por uh, Chell had in Portal 1 compared to Portal 2. And I really do think that when uh, they're more standardized or understood basic types of heights and jumps, even if you would uh, essentially get as much use out of the jump in Portal 2 as you would in Portal 1, because it's more similar and comparable to other video games, I think it becomes easier to get a grasp and understanding of how far you can jump or what jumps you can and cannot reach or things that you can that are and are out of your reach because you just have more experience to compare it to another video game. So this is purely cosmetic, but uh, it was something that I definitely noticed and made my experience way more enjoyable, <laughs> was the, uh, the, the more normalized jumps in video gaming. So those are mechanics that were tweaked and changed a little bit. Um, let's start talking about new mechanics. So there were some mechanics that existed in Portal 1, but they just couldn't get them polished enough in time for release and finished uh, for release in Portal 1. Um, but because they were very far along in development in Portal 1, when they start working on Portal 2, they were able to really clean it up and get it working and start incorporating it into puzzles early on. So one of these mechanics was the light bridges. Light bridges were something that were supposed to exist in Portal 1. Um, they were, you know, they had an origin point where they'd be spawning out of a wall. They would run, uh, eventually run forward until they hit a wall, and the player could use portals to extend these bridges to different locations. Um, and these were brought into Portal 2. The other one would also be the excursion funnels. These were essentially um, anti-gravity wormholes where uh, you would enter into it, and you would be sucked into it, and you would continue traveling along the path that was determined in front of it by the excursion point excursion funnel origin point similar to light bridges but um you could also use portals to extend the location of these funnels to solve puzzles as well so we had uh uh light bridges and excursion funnels finally able to be cleaned up and finished in time for portal 2's release and they were able to be incorporated into the puzzles as well so Let's talk about a brand new mechanic that was entirely new for Portal. Um, this was the gels. So Valve just really has a habit of pulling college kids, groups of college kids, and taking them back to their place because Valve uh, decided to do the same thing as they did for Portal 1. So uh, a, a quick, very brief catch up. Um, Portal 1 was a group of students who were at uh, Digite sorry, DigiPen Digital Institute of Technology and uh it was a school for game design and the students were in their final years of college finishing up over there and they had for their senior project created a game uh called narbacular drop which was uh, a game where you would place portals on walls and travel through them one of the people who worked at valve saw this game invited the team to valve headquarters to pitch their idea for the game and during the pitch valve offered them jobs at the studio to turn narbacular drop and turn it into a full game which ended up becoming portal Valve clearly could not kick the habit because during the development of Portal 2, they had found a new group of students from DigiPen's uh, Institute of Technology, and they decided to bring them on board. This, the project that that team was working on was called a, a game called Tag the Power of Paint. And this was a game where the player would take three different types of colored paints and interact with them to solve puzzles. Uh, one of the pu paints would be one where the player could bounce off of them, either jump off of them off the ground or bounce with them off walls. There was another paint that when the player was moving across it, it would greatly increase their speed. And then there was a final paint that when it was sprayed on walls, it was basically a sticky paint that would allow you to walk up the walls. So um, just like the students were brought on, just like the students who made Narbacular Drop were brought on to turn it into an interesting, uh, taking the concept and turning it into an interesting project, uh, the team who was working on TAG were given the same instructions, turn the concept into an interesting project. And somewhere along in the design process, they decided that the uh, interesting project that they could do would be to incorporate it into portal itself so the paints ended up becoming the gels that we see in portal um the we had the propulsion gel which was the orange gel i really think that that's orange right 
I'm colorblind. Please don't yell at me. I'm pretty sure it's orange. Um, we had uh, the propulsion gel, which was an orange gel that when the player moved on top of it would drastically increase your speed. Um, this was nearly identical to how it functioned in tag. Um, it is orange. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, we had the repulsion gel, which was the blue gel. That when the player, uh, whenever the gel would land on an item or a surface, that item would start bouncing all over the place or that surface would become bouncy. Uh, basically acted almost like flubber. So the player could uh, spray it on the surface and then land on the, on the blue gel and then bounce back up to their equal height. This also functioned almost identically to how it didn't tag. I believe the only difference is in portal, uh, when you are holding the crouch button when you land on it you actually don't bounce I don't believe you have that function in tag I love this proto splatoon it's actually really funny you bring up uh, <laughs> splatoon because we'll actually be talking about uh, splatoon very briefly a little bit later <laughs> um the third gel uh, is the conversion gel conversion gel uh, in the game certain objects uh, are objects that you can place portals on. They're usually denoted by a white color palette. That's why the um, test chambers in portal are have these white panels all over the place. Anything that was white generally was something that you could place a portal on, and anything that was not white was generally something you could not put a portal on. And conversion gel was a gel that when it was placed on any type of surface, that surface would then become something that you could place a portal on. And this was theorized to have originally been the sticky gel that was in tag because uh, the, the sticky the sticky gel that when um, placed on a wall would allow players to walk up the wall. They had gotten the sticky gel incorporated into portal and it was functioning. But the problem was uh, after play test, the overwhelming majority of players said that the sticky gel made them really motion sick. So they decided to scrap it. And instead, they, uh, I mean, I, I don't exactly know if they repurposed or got to the idea of conversion gel at some point, but um, eventually sticky gel was supposed to be in the game. It was dropped eventually, and then we ended up getting conversion gel by the end of it. So those are all the different uh, mechanics that were integrated into the game. Let's go back uh, to talk about the story itself and uh, how the devs have been working on quite a few joke endings. For the game so there was a couple different joke endings in the game that was being worked on one of them was uh you would at some point be able to briefly see the moon and if you shot a portal at the moon uh chell would be sucked out into the vacuum of space and then die and then the credits would roll and then you'd start hearing a song playing about how you died uh, a sad song about how you died choking to death in space um the the devs decided that it just really wasn't worth the time and resources to continue creating more uh, joke endings like this. They would have to uh, to do them. They had to allocate time to the writers uh, for them to write joke endings as opposed to, you know, actually writing more uh, about the, the story itself or continuing the project of the main game. They'd have to allocate time and resources to uh, coders actually creating these joke endings in the in-game engine. Um, and they would even have to allocate time to uh, writing special songs about this. Uh, I imagine, I wonder if they would actually had gotten to the point of actually recording any of the songs. I imagine they wouldn't, but they probably had started the process of writing the songs for these joke endings. Um, but it was a lot of different resources, and the biggest problem was many players wouldn't even find these joke endings. Uh, they, they would incorporate them into the levels and have the players test them out, um, test out the levels hoping that they encounter them, but the players almost never encountered these joke endings in the first place, so for a slew of different reasons, uh, they decided to drop the multiple joke endings in the game. Uh, but uh, while we're on the topic of endings, just like in Portal 1, the devs were really struggling to come up with an ending to Portal 2 and specifically the boss fight. Uh, at the end of Portal 2 because they had still remembered the lessons that they learned from Portal 1 that it's not about having a really flashy final challenge. Um, it, it's just not in the, the type, it, it just doesn't fit Portal very well. And they also realized that long, thoughtful puzzles really just were not climactic. Um, it should really be an epic finale where the villain just gets their comeuppance. It's just uh, very, uh, they wanted a satisfying ending, a, a true resolution to the villain getting the, what they deserve, the just desserts at the end. But they were really unsure and couldn't figure out the best way to tie everything together at the end. 
And then eventually someone brought up the idea of the old joke ending that they scrapped, the one where you go to the moon and end up dying. However, they want, thought about maybe incorporating it as a real ending. Um, they realized that portaling to the moon, while it was funny, could absolutely be an incredibly epic moment and a really climactic uh, finale. And uh, just my own personal, I'm wondering if this is where, uh, I mean, this, I'm pretty sure this is where they got the idea of the moon rocks from. Uh, in Portal 2, they talk about when they first introduced the conversion gel, they, it is a substance that is made of crushed up moon rocks. So whatever this white uh, portal substance is, it, it, or whatever the white conversion gel substance is, it's made of moon rocks and you can portal to it. So it makes total sense why you can place the portal on the moon and travel there. But now I'm wondering it's if it's a chicken and egg kind of situation where did they uh, think of this explanation before they had the ability to travel to the moon or was it the other way around? I don't know, kind of interesting. Not that crazy, Easter eggs are the best. Easter eggs are one of my favorite things in video games because Easter eggs are something that is, uh, it, it's very difficult to create, to, to dedicate time and resources to creating a part of a game that players might not ever encounter. Uh, video games are expensive and time consuming to make. So it definitely is a cost efficiency thing where doing no Easter eggs is much more cost effective. Absolutely. So any developers that decide to say, screw that, we're going to put in a fun Easter egg anyway, automatically gets my respect. I absolutely love Easter eggs. They're one of my favorite things ever. Um, but uh, in the end, the devs had combined the lessons that they learned with Portal 1, uh, along with a leftover scrapped idea from Portal 2 to create one of the most memorable moments, uh, one of the most memorable finales in video gaming history. So that's the uh, story and the world of Portal 2's uh, main mode. Let's start talking about something else. Um, when Portal 1 had released to the public and the team had come together and started sharing their experiences while they were brainstorming about what to do for Portal 2, uh, team members would talk about how they played Portal 1 with their family or a significant other and how they would work together to try to figure out the solutions to the puzzle where one person would be in control of the controller Whereas one other person would kind of be brainstorming and trying to, you know, pitch and suggest ideas. And that the two, uh, that, that the, you know, members of the staff with their significant other or family members would effectively create their own co-op mode. And so uh, this was a very common occurrence that a lot of devs talked about. And since it was so common that this motivated the devs to create their own real dedicated co-op mode early in the game. Um, it was just, it was just a fun bonding experience for the people taking part in it together. Uh, so let's, uh, bef before we really start diving into this a little more, I want to take a brief tangent to talk about something. Uh, something a lot of people don't know is when it comes to the really early stages of development, uh, good games generally start off with um, not characters, not necessarily a world or aesthetic or art style or anything like that. It's just the base mechanics. The, the important part, uh, most important part of creating a good game is making sure that the foundation itself is fun and enjoyable because that's what games are supposed to be. They're supposed to be fun and enjoyable. And uh, while that is definitely relative to each individual, uh, when it comes to video games, it is an interactive medium. So generally, the main thing about creating a good foundation is fun gameplay mechanics. So what a lot of teams will do is when they're testing a new gameplay mechanic, they will start off with very bare bones types of characters. And to uh, show this off, let's look at a pre-alpha screenshot of uh, Splatoon. Tell me, <laughs> does this look anything like what you'd expect of uh, Splatoon? Sorry for any audio listeners who are just listening to the audio, but... Yeah, when it comes to, uh, the, I mean, Splatoon being made by Nintendo, one of the most well-known studios in the world, you would think that when they're making a video game in the earlier stages that they would have much more fleshed out designs. But no, when they were toying with the idea of paint as a mechanic, painting uh, the enemies, painting the floors, swimming through it, all the different interweaving mechanics, it all started right here. It all started with two rectangles with a nose, um, one being a light color, one being a dark color, uh, just kind of sprang all over the place just to see if the ideas were fun. And that eventually is what ended up becoming Splatoon. The, the characters were Tofu, basically. <laughs> um, this is very standard for game development. This happens all the time. And so uh, 
they were probably doing the same thing with Portal 2 itself. I could not exactly find any pre-alpha footage. But um, to go back, to, to link this back to Portal, um, when they when the when the devs were creating the levels for a co-op mode they obviously had to give some kind of uh that they had to play test it with people and one thing they learned really really early on in the develop in the testing process was that uh before they even added the player characters they realized that one of testers favorite things to do was to kill their teammates and the devs really liked this and they really wanted to lean into this and ham it up a little bit and they really wanted to play up um the the deaths of their teammates the problem was if they did do it with chell being human it would be gory and gruesome and that kind of would make it less fun in the portal universe itself um they also really wanted the deaths to be more comedic um, and they wanted them to be less punishing, so they didn't want the rooms to reset. They didn't want they didn't want uh, both of them to reset if one of them died. Um, and so they had this kind of list of issues of making it so that they could lean into and maybe not incentivize, but totally make it uh, acknowledge that they know that players enjoy killing their teammates. They wanted to kind of play this up and lean into it and. Uh, kind of shine a light on it a little bit more but they also want to make sure that this uh, while doing it you weren't necessarily punishing yourselves too hard so they realized the best way to do this was to make both of the characters robots uh for the two-player co-op mode um it checked all the boxes it was something that um their deaths would not be gory and gruesome because they don't have blood and guts and viscera all over the place they just explode into pieces in a uh, very pretty way almost like fireworks um, it makes total logical sense that they would be able to respawn almost instantly and be, be totally unharmed and totally fine. And it also makes sense uh, why one of them would be able to die and they would be able to continue going as well. So uh, that is the origin and the reasoning as to why they ended up having uh, robots as the two main characters in the co-op mode as opposed to the human that they have with Shell in single player mode. I swear it all goes back to Quake Deathmatch like how the end of Quake required a telefrag. I feel like there's so much to unpack there. Quake Deathmatch. I was I was under the impression that Quake was a multiplayer only game. I did not know Quake had a single player mode. Deathmatch also seems like a multiplayer only mode. And how the end of Quake required a telefrag. I'm just, that sounds almost like an exploit as opposed to an intended uh, mechanic. Looks like an anime opening. As long as it's not a fur baby, then all bets are off. As long as it's not a Furby. No, if it's a Furby, we kill those. Never mind. Alright. So, that was the origin of the designs for um, the robots for the co-op mode. But, that wasn't the only co-op mode that actually existed during the testing phase. They had tried to make some competitive multiplayer modes, and they actually had four or five semi-working ideas. The in-house working name for one of them was Portal Combat, and basically the players would place portals to try to drop objects onto the to other players. They would try to redirect lasers at other players to try to kill them, or they would try and you know um, drop a portal underneath someone to make them fall to their death into a pit below. Um, there was another one. It was a football type of game where uh, a player had to take a ball and try to carry it to a certain location in order to score. Players could use portals as a means to try to travel quickly. Um, or the other team could use portals to try to dump opposing players uh, to different places that they didn't want to go. Um, while they were functioning and while they were working, they realized early on in testing that it just really wasn't fun. Uh, going through portals normally, sometimes your character will flip their orientation to be upright again, and that on its own can be a little disorienting. But to be walking forward and then all of a sudden at random, you start falling through a portal, maybe flipping upside down, maybe facing a completely different way, and now all of a sudden you have to realize where you are located and now you have to get back. Um, that's way more orienting and almost like, honestly kind of frustrating. <laughs> an idea um so they learned pretty quickly that when it came to portal the cooperative puzzle solving was definitely the way that the portal mechanics shine the best and uh actually any kind of any sense of competition in any kind of co-op mode was actually met with pretty negative responses uh throughout the game glados tries to drive a wedge between the two players and the uh, uh 
bunch of different ways the two robots and at one point during the development they had uh glados started giving arbitrary meaningless points to the players essentially chosen at complete random this did not go over very well. Uh, at one point, the points were just four, you know, the points, I put in air quotes, were four pineapples. Uh, GLaDOS would uh, award four pineapples to one of the players. Um, despite the fact this meant absolutely nothing, uh, what the other player basically heard was, whoa, they got points, I want some of those points too. And then the players would then become frustrated and irritated when they could not figure out how these points were divvied out in the first place and why themselves could not get any points as well. So what was originally just meant to be a fun, goofy joke ended up causing uh, players to be frustrated because it was a competitive aspect between the two players. So they ended up, uh, the devs scrapped the idea entirely. Um, and finally, the reason why uh, the, the, the this wasn't really a reason they said, but this was just an idea that they had. This was something they were aware of. Um, if they were trying to make a competitive type of game, they'd basically be throwing their hats into uh, other rings where they was much more populated or they had products that were much more focused on those specifically. So, um, I mean, puzzle games as a whole were still pretty niche at the time uh they're still in the grand scheme of things a relatively small genre compared to others but they were much more small at the time and co-op puzzle games are pretty much non-existent they don't really have competition with that um multiplayer shooters on the other hand were ubiquitous all over the place this was definitely towards the high point of the the um the typical shooter uh as yahtzee would say the uh spunk gargle wee wee games uh they were all over the place and then if they wanted to, you know, focus on the football type of multiplayer game, sports games already had extremely passionate followings where people were very dedicated to their IPs. It would be kind of difficult to uh, try to transition these players over to try out portals, multiplayer aspects uh, for, for the, the competitive aspects. So there was just so many different reasons why it wasn't really a great idea to try to dedicate time and resources to creating multiplayer different types of uh, games in it. Hey, what's up, Yandere? This is super cool. I never knew so much about portals. There is so much information out there about portal. The devs, um, Valve just seems like a really cool company uh, in terms of being very forthright and uh, public about decisions that they made with games. They definitely don't try to hide a lot of stuff. Um, which is awesome. They seem to be very proud of the games that they made. They're very happy with the game. So uh, they do tons of interviews and they give lots of information. Um, there was a lot of resources for me to sift through with uh, when, when uh, researching Portal 1 and Portal 2. So um, just like, uh, you know, we talked about with Bioshock, um, when it comes to sequels like this, they really aren't as groundbreaking because Portal 1 itself was very groundbreaking. Portal 2 wasn't nearly as groundbreaking because the predecessor, the earlier game, was the one that was the groundbreaking and Portal 2 was just kind of building off of, uh, on top of it. Um, so it's not really say to, uh, fair to say that Portal 2 was groundbreaking. There really wasn't much about it was groundbreaking, but in terms of influential, I think the number one thing why this that, that this game is going to be influential about is the fact that it is a fantastic comedy game. <clears throat> if you look at any um, comedian, their number one rule they always say when it comes to good comedy is timing. And when you look at other mediums like uh, television or music or stand-up comedy or TV shows, um, specifically TV shows and movies, the director is able to write the script out, re-record the scenes, they're able to edit it, change the camera angles and everything to make sure that everything is being presented and shown to the viewer in a very specific manner where they're able to control the timing and the delivery of the joke. Um, you know, I, uh, comedy is definitely easiest, I say easiest, because um, it's still not easy, but it's easiest to do in movies and television because they are the ones controlling the experience and the viewpoint for people to um, to watch and have the timing be in their control. When it comes to video games, the player has control of what they're doing. They're the ones moving around. They're the ones interacting with things. Um, to have timing be... Uh, consistent in video games is an extremely difficult thing to do. The player could be um, distracted with something else. They could be talking to friends. They could be um, pausing the menu to do something. Um, the 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 it's 
impossible to do and it's very common in video games to do their jokes exclusively through um cutscenes, but that it's at that point just becomes a movie as well uh, I, I, when it comes to video games, there aren't a whole lot of games that put a huge emphasis on comedy throughout the entire thing. And Portal did do that, and Portal did an absolutely fantastic job. I think any developers that are going to try to create a game that emphasizes or focuses on comedy is absolutely going to be looking back at Portal as a massive influence on how to get it done. Because everything that they did in Portal did such a good job at just commanding center stage. Uh, for all the jokes that they throw in there. I remember in the earlier stages, there's the, the part with Wheatley when he's still uh, alive and tutorializing and kind of guiding the player through sections. They have the point where he is on the rail and he has to detach himself from the rail because it can no longer go forward. And, you know, he was told that if he detaches himself from the rail that he's going to die. So he's terrified. And then he detaches himself from the rail and you can either catch him or you don't catch him. Either ends in different jokes that are hilarious, but it's all something that could have absolutely been uh, ruined if the player wasn't paying attention or if they were focusing on something else or trying to interact with something else or trying to look for hidden objects or what have you. Um, but... Portal did such a great job of commanding the player's attention where it needed to be at all times, and every joke seemed to land. It was uh, They did such a fantastic job, and any game that plans on doing a comedy game is going to be looking at Portal 2 as an influence, for sure. The Gravity Gun throw. Oh, because <laughs> the Gravity Gun from, um, from Half-Life, yeah. Did you say, uh, didn't you say last time that the team initially wanted to make GLaDOS a companion because they actually got to do that in 2? Yes, they actually did as well. So the original idea in Portal 1 was they were going to have GLaDOS as a little robot companion that kind of escorted through the uh, test chambers with you. And they did not do that, thankfully. Um, but yeah, they actually did kind of get to do that to an extent in Portal 2 when she becomes your little pet potato. So they, uh, I mean, it just kind of came full circle with so many different things they were trying to do. Um, all right. So we've been going for a little over an hour and a half now. I'm going to take a short break. I'm going to get some tea because I've been talking nonstop for about an hour and a half. Um, I'm going to take a short break for just a couple minutes. When I come back, we're going to talk about the reception of Portal, the sales of Portal, and what the industry can learn from Portal 2 itself. So, uh, yeah, if you need to go get a drink or go to the bathroom, now would be the time to do it. We will be back in just a few minutes, so uh, stay put. How far did you look into Nintendo? Into I, so basically what I do is I go to Wikipedia, and Wikipedia has a page that uh, shows... Basically what I did is I go to Wikipedia and Wikipedia has uh, a certain page where it shows video game history year by year and it shows all the releases in a year and I can change from year to year. So what I do is I went to April 19th of 2011 and I went six months back. So I went back to 2010, started from October, did November, or sorry, I did November and then December and then did the next 10 months afterwards. So um, I just looked through there. Um, there might have not been any huge major releases for the 3DS in that early window, which would be kind of surprising because I feel like they launched something big there. But Ooh, and hi, Shaba. How are you doing? <laughs> You're the only potato for us. Oh, thank you. Oh, uh, you know, I think I did see those. Uh, Star Fox 64 for the. Uh, for 3D, pretty much literally 3D. OOT did have some quality of life adjustments, but I also didn't feel like it was fair enough to just uh, really consider that as listing. And I know nothing about Kirby Mass Attack to know if that was uh, a huge release or not. Hmm. I forgot one thing. Hold on. Sorry, I'm back. 
Which tells me it probably wasn't, yeah. I try to list just more specifically major releases. Uh, as opposed to... Um, as opposed to just big IPs. Uh, for example... Oh. Yeah, for the most part, it, not necessarily like, just because it's a big IP necessarily means it's something I put on the list. It could be a big, it has to be some kind of significant release or something that kind of made a dent or caught people's attention, you know? All right. So let's get back into this. So we've talked about, um, you know, the history of the Portal IP, talked about the games that came out around its release. We talked about Portal 2 itself, its full, um, uh, we, we kind of analyzed tons of different uh, things about it, uh, things that changed from Portal 1 into Portal 2. But now let's talk about the actual reception to the game and what the gaming community generally thought about it. So uh, when I do the reception part, uh, what I when it comes to reception for a video game, <laughs> it varies a ton and there is no consistent way to really look at this that compares uh, people's opinions to one another. Um, the closest thing that I can do is just number scores. Um, it's not accurate, but it's the best I can do. And so what I do is I go on uh, Metacritic and I pull the numbers from there as a basis point because Metacritic is an aggregate score site. So it takes a bunch of different critics and it averages the scores out there. And something that is important to note, um, when it comes to Metacritic, what they do is they take scores from, uh, you know, the, the, the major review sites. But what is becoming more popular as of recently is reviewers won't give a standard number score. They will give... Um, you know, they won't give any kind of final verdict on it. It's just the review. Um, sometimes they will say it's a good game, an okay game, a great game. They won't give it a, uh, a number or any kind of scaling grade for that. Um, what Metacritic will do is it will take these reviews and try to guess on what that would score would be on a number scale from 1 to 100. And then they sign it that way. Um, just something to point out. This is something this is... Uh, for older games, this really isn't an issue because with older games, they tended to all give them more direct number scores. Um, but I still want to throw that out there so people understand. Um, in Portal 2's case, I think it was right before the, that trend started setting in. So I think as far as number scores go, I think it's pretty accurate. So on to the actual reception of Portal 2. And big surprise, this also got universal acclaim just like Portal 1 did. Um, it actually had higher critical reception than Portal 1, but had a lower player uh, reception than Portal 1, interesting enough. So the Metacritic score for, uh, this is the professional review scores, um, for Portal 2 was 95 across the board on all platforms. So Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, PC, all versions got a score of 95. And it was the third highest scored game on Metacritic in the year uh, of 2011. The only games that beat it out were Arkham City and Skyrim. Um, but it is tied for 44th best rated game of all time. Um, alongside 16 other games like Metal Gear Solid 5, Red Dead Redemption 1, uh, Persona 5 Royale, The Last of Us, uh, Majora's Mask, and Halo 2. So definitely a fantastic game up there with some of the greats and then uh looking at the user score it averaged out to a score of 8.8 uh the highest score was on pc it had a score of 9.1 and the lowest score was on playstation 3 with a score of 8.5 um it is scored it is tied for the seventh highest scored game of all time with games like ori and the will of the wisp uh half-life alex left 4 dead 1 super mario galaxy 2 okami shadow of the colossus ttyd uh sorry paper mario thousand year door uh half-life 2 banjo kazooie and super smash bros melee so um also very high up on the list with some other fantastic games um kind of interesting to find that it had a lower average player score than the critics score or sorry, that, that is totally common. I'm kind of surprised that uh, Portal 2 did better um, critic-wise, but lower player-wise. Kind of odd. But as for the actual public reception itself, uh, people were very impressed with the game and satisfied considering the first game didn't need a sequel at all. Um, there were a lot of different uh, reviews for Portal 1 that said that there was absolutely no need and they kind of be setting themselves up for failure if they tried to create a sequel to it. But it 
did fantastic and people were overwhelmingly positive and they just loved the game so much and the game was mostly praised for its fantastic writing the expansion of the puzzle game mechanics and its well-established difficulty curve this is something a lot of people uh, i think overlook it's one of those things that um you don't notice it's in existence, uh, it exists in video games until someone fucks it up or does it really bad, but the difficulty curve for solving puzzles and poor, um, uh, test chambers in this game really built up in a uh, pretty clean and consistent way. They did a really good job with that. Um, hi, Prim. Right, oh, the writing is definitely the standout thing about this game. The, 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 the puzzles themselves, the mechanics are fantastic, but, um, I don't know, like, at the time, Portal was very unique with its mechanics. Portal 1 specifically, um, very, very unique, creating a portal that you can go into and out of, and I feel like that's just so much more common nowadays, and it's kind of a, a very simple mechanic, puzzle-solving mechanic, or just a basic mechanic in video games in the first place. Um, but, you know, while it was huge at the time, mechanics are something that will always evolve and maybe something that is groundbreaking or wild or just uh, very difficult for people to grasp in five, ten years could become completely standard. It could be so ubiquitous that everyone thinks about it and uh, no, sorry, no one even has to think about it. They just kind of do it. So while uh, people enjoy and talk about how much they love the mechanics, the thing that definitely stands out is the writing because um, writing is just one of those things that is so completely unique in how people approach things for the games that it's not something that really can be uh, become standard or understood because every game's writing style is very different. So yeah, the writing is super awesome and that's the thing that everyone talks about because that's not something that can really be uh, copied or become standardized in other video games. So, reception, big surprise. Everyone absolutely loved it. So let's talk about the sales. The sales info I got for this game was actually kind of interesting in itself. Um, I go to VG Charts for my res resources for uh, where the sales come from. They usually cite their locations where they get their sales numbers from when they market. Um, usually it comes down to different interviews or uh meetings with stockholders where they talk about some of the sales numbers because it drives me absolutely nuts and god i really really wish this would change in the near future but no one talks about sales numbers anymore um they boast about sales numbers when they do good it used to be in the past when numbers when when sales in video games were physical <laughs> um the different outlets uh you know gamestop and walmart they would all basically announce the numbers for what games sold to the extent that they did so the numbers are much more public as things become more digital as time goes on um if you buy something directly from the xbox or you buy something directly off di uh, sony's digital storefront they don't have to release the numbers of what the sales are for their games um, and they usually don't unless it's something to, bro to boast and brag about and even then i think it's very possible that these numbers could be embellished in some way um I really, really wish there was a, a, a way, uh, I wish it would become more standard for uh, studios to have to give the numbers publicly. But anyway, back to the topic on hand. Um, this information was very interesting because in 2018, this is uh, pretty recently, there was a hole found in Valve's API that allowed people to access information about player numbers for games on Steam. And in this info, it was found that just over 13 million people had played Portal 2 on Steam at some point. And then when we combine this with VG Charts' numbers, uh, the console versions of the game have sold 3.8 million copies. So altogether, it sold just short of 17 million copies. Um, this is uh, something to note, is this is 13.06 million people who have played Portal 2. This is not necessarily people who have purchased it. Um, they, these are people who maybe could have... Um, got a humble bundle and it included portal 2 this could be people who um maybe got it at some point when it was free on the steam store or things like that um this isn't necessarily direct sales this also does not count uh there are people out there who probably have portal 2 in their library but they've never actually played it the heathens so this is the numbers that we got from the valve api leak was strictly just people who have played portal 2 on steam at some point good ballpark number not very uh spot on but um yeah a lot of people just short of um 17 million which is crazy 
That's me. I own it and never played it. What are you doing, man? Are you serious? You need to play it. It's so good. Portal 2 is a relatively short game. How long does it take to beat Portal 2? It's probably like six hours. Seriously, play it. It's so good. So, um, moving on from the sales into the sequels. I mean, this was the sequel. Um, there has not since been a Portal 3. There hasn't been an announcement from Portal 3 because we all know Valve can't count to three. Uh, there was a DLC that continued the story of GLaDOS and her bird, the rivalry between them, the one that tried to eat her when she was just a potato. Um, that was very well received. Um, but the only other thing that continued with this game was about a year after they released Portal 2, um, Steam released the Perpetual Testing, Testing Initiative, which uh, allowed people on PC to create their own test chambers um, to share amongst other players. Uh, the closest thing to compare this to is it's uh, basically Mario Maker or Little Big Planet. It's uh, their own builder for people to create their own chambers, um, test chambers for to share amongst other people for them to solve. Kind of giving it an infinite type of uh, an infinite replayability kind of thing. But as far as that, um, I mean, I talked about it in Portal 1. There is the VR game. I can't remember what it's called, but there is a VR game that takes place in the Portal universe. It's kind of supposed to be... Tech demo isn't the, the best way to put it, but it's basically like the Nintendo Land of the VR. Nintendo Land was that game that came with the Wii U that was meant to showcase all the different features and things that could be done with the U gameplay tablet and the console itself. This VR game that took place in the portal universe was the same thing it was supposed to showcase all the different physics and things that could be done and experiences that could be had in vr it just took place in the portal 2 universe and it had that portal 2 writing because it's some funny stuff if i had a vr set it would definitely be one of my purchases i would make uh, from what i'd seen briefly excuse me still it's cool they're still keeping the franchise alive, even if they're not making games like how they did shell skin and fall guys yeah it's 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 good i'm i'm happy they're keeping it alive i don't know what i want i mean i want more i want something but i don't know what i want i don't want to force them to make a sequel if they don't think they're able to make a sequel that's quality but I want something more from the Aperture universe. I would be okay if we got a Portal 3 that was how they were originally going to do Portal 2, where it's not something necessarily with portals, but a new puzzle solving mechanic that just takes place in the Aperture world. I want another game uh, with the same writing um, in that same universe. I'd be okay if they made a Portal 3 similar to how they were going to make Portal 2. If they made a Portal 3 that was, you know, an expansion and continuation of Portal, with the same portal mechanics and same characters, I'd be fine about. What do I think Portal 3 is about? <laughs> what? Wait a second, Cairo. Why are you asking that as if you know for a fact it's about and you're testing me? Do you know something that we don't, Cairo? Are you holding out on us? Do you have information that you're not sharing? A portal related non portal game? I mean, there's the, uh, what is it? The bridge building simulator game, but it's Portal. <laughs> is that what you're looking for, Prim? <clears throat> oh, they're acting sus as hell. Oh, no, 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 you can't abort. You can't back out of this. Nice try. Half-Life 2 out of the dark is basically had Gary's mod, Stanley Parable. Stanley Parable was fantastic. I love Stanley Parable. Such a fun game. Hmm. I didn't know there was a half- Are you talking about uh, uh, Half-Life to editor are you talking just like about source engine in general <laughs> deep cuts more lore yeah i'd be okay with that too all right so we talk about most of the things that there is to talk about now let's move on to the last part of the discussion that's going to be what can we learn about portal 2 what can the industry learn from portal 2 what lessons can be taken from this <clears throat> <coughs> one of the early lessons that they learned in this game when developing this game very early on was that uh, they really it's it's important to listen to early tester feedback early on in the design process valve tried replacing portals with new mechanics and an entirely new cast they weren't even gonna have portal gun in the game the reception to these mechanics 
and these additions were relatively good, but people still wanted the things that they knew Portal for, so they eventually brought back Portal, they brought back Shell, they brought GLaDOS back, and everything like that. Um, they learned their lesson that while it is great to uh, to innovate, it's great to breathe new life into the game, it's not always the, the best way to go. Sometimes uh, sticking with what you know to an extent and building off of that is much better than kind of starting anew and starting from scratch. <laughs> Another lesson that I think can be learned from Portal 2 is that I think it can be argued that smaller, simpler games are much more easy to create sequels for uh, because you look at large, long games with tons of content, it can be very difficult to create a sort of follow-up that people are excited for. Um... I'm probably going to get a lot of uh, flack for this. I'm sure a lot of people are going to be very angry and disagree with me on this. But I think, uh, again, this is my opinion from what I can gather. I feel like when it comes to good sequels in video games, <laughs> good sequels typically tend to boil down to one of three things. Um, and two of these are very risky. Again, there are tons of different ways to make sequels depending on the genre or the community of the game. Um, what those people consider good sequels varies a ton. What is considered a good sequel in general is just up to interpretation. These are just three sequels that tend to be frequently, from my observations, tend to be frequently seen as good sequels by the majority of critics and players alike. So the first one is the more safe bet. This is a uh, polish. Uh, yeah, this is um, a type of sequel that polishes what was in the first game to a near perfect shine. <coughs> and then adding some new content on top of it of equal quality and shine. It can almost be seen kind of like a large expansion pack. Um, this is kind of similar to how Portal really approached it. They took a lot of the mechanics that existed in Portal 1, really polished the heck out of it, polished the presentation, made it real clean, made it really nice, um, and then expanded a little bit more with better writing, uh, a couple more new puzzle solving mechanics. And it was, this game was beloved by so many people. I mean, it's on the, the top list for critic reviews, player reviews, and just general um, reviews and blog posts that different sites and review sites will put out there. This is also a double-edged sword though, because this is the exact same thing that Bioshock 2 did. Bioshock 2 cleaned up a lot of different mechanics that existed in Bioshock 1. They, you know, upgraded the aesthetic and the art style. <laughs> they added some new characters added some new additions to to weapon upgrades and everything like that and it was really great it was really clean but the game is pretty much the redheaded stepchild forgotten about in the bioshock universe because while it is a cleaned up polished uh expansion of bioshock one um that's not the main reason why people enjoyed playing bioshock one people like playing bioshock one because it was so enriching in the storytelling and so groundbreaking on how it told stories and created that experience instead it um when you take that and you basically just give it an expansion pack, it kind of goes against why people were drawn into it in the first place. And it's partially why Bioshock Infinite did so fantastic. So this is the the safer approach, but it's also one that's, uh, I wouldn't say lazy, but it also, um, it, I think people realize it is the safer approach so they don't go into it with as much enthusiasm uh, as they would with a, with a different type of sequel. So one of the other ways that, uh, one of the other three ways that a good sequel can be done, this is one of the risky ways, is basically rebooting the series in some way that's radically different from the previous game. The obvious risk with this is that you risk alienating the people who love the first game and are more passionate about a sequel than anyone else. When it comes to getting, uh, getting games to be sold, I, no one can tell me otherwise, the number one way to get games sold is word of mouth. Uh, I think a lot of people, you know, they see advertising. <laughs> well, that may work with younger people who don't realize they just ask their parents and the parents might purchase it for them just to make them happy. I think the vast majority of people realize that when it comes to advertising, it's meant to showcase 
the best looking parts of the game or the most aesthetically pleasing, the most flashy. Um, I think I feel like as time goes on, people are becoming much more wary when it comes to advertising and they are much more willing to trust word of mouth from other people. If they hear from their friends that a game or a series is fantastic, they're gonna be much more interested than if they see an advertisement. Uh, at the beginning of a YouTube video or on TV or something like that. When you are rebooting a series, you are taking a big risk and potentially alienating the people who love, the diehard fans who love the first entry in the series. And those are the people who are going to get word of mouth out to try to get people interested in buying in your series. If you kind of lose that core audience, <clears throat> that's a lot of potential advertising and good uh, publicity that could potentially go down the drain. However, it can end up working out really well. You have examples like um, Breath of the Wild, where typical Zelda games, you know, they have the standard, the, the hook shot, the bow, the iron boots, all these different things. They have these six different dungeons or, you know, whatever amount of dungeons that ends up being in that game. Um, the progression to get the MacGuffins. Um, Zelda, while it's uh, unique in certain ways, it has a very established formula and Breath of the Wild was very very different from the previous ones not the story the story is identical as any other Zelda game but the mechanics and how you explore and progress through the game was wildly different from anything else in the previous Zelda games and it caught up a lot of people's attention and uh, drew them into play and the reception was very very positive people absolutely loved that game but at the same time this is a uh, <clears throat> method that could totally backfire one of these examples would probably be Banjo Kazooie Nuts and Bolts one of the games we talked about earlier in the series I think it was episode five of design of play no I think it was four of design of play um, where we talked about Banjo Kazooie Nuts and Bolts the uh, first two Banjo Kazooie games were basic 3d collect-a-thumb platformers where you platform through uh, a couple different theme levels collecting MacGuffins to progress to the next level and continue on while learning new moves that gave you access to new locations and access to new objectives and puzzles to solve. And um, Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts rebooted the series. And instead of uh, going through and platforming and learning moves to access new areas, you go through the game um, building vehicles to help solve uh, people's issues and uh, complete objectives and your reward is more vehicle parts that allows you to create different vehicles to eventually have ones that go from just driving on land to driving on the water or diving under the water or um, flying in the air or becoming a helicopter as opposed to a plane and then adding different uh, trays to carry stuff or and you add weapons to attack things and it builds upon that so so drastically very different from the first two Banjo Kazooie games, and the result of that was that critically the game uh, was received pretty well. People enjoyed it, um, the critics enjoyed it, but the players were horribly disappointed and trashed the game constantly. And only in recently have people started to um, lighten up a little about it, about it, and uh, look at it from a different point of view and give it the praise it deserves and the criticism it deserves, <laughs> as opposed to being so extreme from both ends of the spectrum. Um, so this type of, the, the type of sequel that reboots the game and starts it over uh, in a very different way, drastic from the first one, is very, very risky. And you can see the results of uh, both it working and it failing. Portal 3 better have combustible weapons. <laughs> So the third and final type of sequel that tends to uh, be seen, uh, received well, is also a risky one. This is the Be a Trailblazer and expand the genre in a new way that hasn't been done before. This is extremely difficult to do just because, I mean, it's the nature of the medium. As time goes on and more games are being made by more studios, especially as more indie developers really start to come in and start making games and have a platform in which they can release it, <laughs> on Steam and the Epic Game Store and the Xbox Live Arcade and the PlayStation storefront. Um, it's just this flood of so many more games. It's harder to be original and create this new type of experience that can expand on something that hasn't been done before. Um, it's just harder to think of that new idea. And the problem is when you really do start to think of something that really is unique and original, it can be very out there and that can be extremely risky as time goes on games take longer to make and become more expensive to make that taking these uh these risks is not a good idea because they're sinking so much more money into creating these and causing more issues and losing a lot more money that uh more publishers and developers don't want to run this risky idea um i can't really think of any recent ideas off the top of my head for games that have done something so drastically different um the closest i could think of <clears throat> would be <laughs> PUBG, and I know I'm probably going to get some flack for this because technically, um, you know, PUBG 
wasn't really the originator of uh, Battle Royales. That started originally, I think, first as a Minecraft mod based on the Hunger Games, and then it became an Arma mod, and then from there, um, the first official type of original release by a studio was, I believe, H1Z1 King of the Kill, where uh, uh, the uh, person, so very brief history, um, the person who created Battle uh, Player Unknown's Battleground was known by his online handle as Player Unknown. Before he made Player Unknown's Battleground, he was a uh, consultant at Blue Hole who made H1Z1 King of the Kill <laughs> and was giving a lot of feedback while they were creating that game. But even before that, he was the one who created one of the largest Arma mods that uh, was a BR type of focus game. So you had Minecraft, which was that, which had the mod originally as one of the first examples of a BR. Um, Arma mods were the second iteration of that and one of the biggest per, uh, per people to create a successful version of that went on to be a major consultant for the uh, first original release of a game focused on BR and then eventually went to create his own game that was kind of the definitive um, BR for a while that people kind of drew off of. Um, this is an example again of trying something completely different and uh, well, I guess this isn't a sequel It kind of is a sequel. It's kind of an expansion. It's it's kind of really murky when you look at it But um, this is the closest example I can think of in recent times where um, You know player unknown split off from h1z1 to create his own kind of spiritual successor That was pretty drastically different um, From any other battle royale games and it went on to sell absolute gangbusters huge game and spawned it really solidified the genre of brs and became popular and ubiquitous all over the place <laughs> info miner i haven't heard of that um i think what else uh, But I think the best way to sum it up is um, Portal 2 was basically the first one. I said they they added a couple new gameplay mechanics here and there, expanded the chambers, really polished up the aesthetic, the art style, um, dumped more uh, manpower into the writing, <coughs> and created a fantastic game. But I think it fell into the category of the first perfect um, type of sequel. But the reason why it works so well is because Portal 1 was such a very short game with very simple mechanics already. Um, it was a little rough around the edges, but um, it was still a very solid game that polishing it up and turning it into a full-fledged experience that was very well received is definitely a lot easier than if you had a giant massive game where you kind of have to pick and choose because when it comes to video games, sequels tend to be you know, bigger and better, larger or more offered than the previous one. Um, when you have <laughs> an extremely large game, like let's say The Witcher 3, it'd be very difficult to follow up The Witcher 3 with The Witcher 4 because The Witcher 3 was such a large game that offered so much that was so well received. Um, to create something bigger and better than that is very difficult to do. Portal 1 being so compact and small um, has some very strong core ideas that is easy to expand upon because of its small scope, it's also easy to expand upon as well. I think that uh, something that can be learned is that when it comes to small games, they tend to be easier to make sequels for. A lot of studios try to make sequels for their big blockbuster hits because it got so much attention and people were so excited for it that it seems like an easy slam dunk but the reality is these massive games that offer so much and already have so much on the plate to expand that into a bigger game is a much more difficult process to do and to pull off successfully on top of that yeah half-life alex definitely could count um yeah relatively new there I just, I know almost nothing about Half-Life, Alex. I really don't. Um, I don't really know much about the Half-Life series in general since I haven't played any of the Half-Life series, but I know very little about Half-Life, Alex, in general and as an experience, so I couldn't even begin to uh, infer or try to place it in that category of which sequel it would be. That was Minecraft Zero. Huh, interesting. I love video games. Hey, I'm planning on doing the, uh, so, uh, I'll be doing the, the Half-Life series soon. But that is all I really have to offer in terms of discussion for Portal 2. 
Does anyone have any last thoughts or anything that they want to bring up about Portal 2? Anything they want to bring to the table? Any interesting notes, tidbits, facts? Uh, for me, I'm trying to think what I have. It does have two in the title, that's true. I never really thought about that. It really changes my perspective on pretty much the whole world. Space! <laughs> Such good writing. I don't know. I loved Portal 2. Um, I was very excited to see that it aged as well as it did. I mean, I played it when it originally first came out. Might have played it once other time after that, but... I hadn't played this game in at least five, six years. At least. Um, this game aged fantastically. <coughs> from a gameplay perspective, from an aesthetic perspective, from a writing perspective, for sure. Um, the game is fantastic. The game is great. I love this game. Um, I'm a total sucker for uh, puzzle games. I love a good puzzle game. Platformers are my thing. They are by far my favorite genre. Um, so having a puzzle platformer combined together was just a slam dunk. <laughs> kind of cheating uh, in terms of me enjoying or liking something. Uh, I don't know. I enjoyed the game. I advocate for anyone and everyone to play it. It's constantly going on sale on Steam all the time. So if you have a PC that's capable of playing anything, uh, there's really no excuse to not play Portal 2. That's really all I got on the subject. Alright, so I guess we'll call it there for this discussion um the plan for the next couple discussions the next one we're going to be doing is spec ops the line <laughs> spec ops the line from a surface viewpoint when you look at it it looks like your typical mid-2000s call of duty clone shoot 'em up kind of game looks very generic very basic um, and that is exactly what they wanted you to think going into the game the game has a lot to offer a lot below the surface as time goes on it's a very interesting game. Um, I'm kind of sad that I had it spoiled for me because I've never actually played it. Um, I'm kind of sad that what the, the game is trying to do was kind of spoiled for me, but it will be interesting to actually play and experience for the first time. Uh, I hope everyone will be there to watch it and be there for the next discussion on the game because it is going to be very interesting to talk about. Um, after I do Spec Ops The Line, I'm going to be doing the original Doom, another game I actually have not played myself. And then after Doom, I will be doing Portal 1, and, or not, <laughs> I will be doing Half-Life 1, followed by Half-Life 2. <laughs> Those are the next four games we've got going on in the discussion series. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I want to thank you everyone for being here. Thanks for being here live for the discussion. If you are watching from YouTube, thank you so much for taking part in watching my videos. I do hope you enjoy them. Um, game design is so cool to me to learn the history about these games and the decisions that they make for these games. Uh, is awesome. The main reason I want to do this was because I feel like we see so many different things in video games. Games have been around for so long and there are so many games coming out uh, at all at the same time now, uh, indie or otherwise. It kind of becomes hard to find out where the origin of certain ideas come from. So this is a fun little exercise to go back and play some of these older games and really realize that certain things we see in modern games have actually been there uh, much longer than we originally realized. So hopefully you will stick around and be here for future discussions. Um, hopefully you'll join us in Twitch. I do have these discussions on my Twitch channel um, where you can talk with chat. That is the, the message up above, the everyone chatting in there. Um, the point of these things is not only to educate but also to hold discussion. So if anyone uh, knows their stuff, is educated on uh, different video games, I hope you'll be here for the discussion so you can help contribute to it as well. I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, so we will be back soon again uh, to have the discussion for Spec Ops Line, and hopefully I will see you there. Have a wonderful night, everyone. See you.